I do want to leave some time being that this might be um, the last time we see each other before tea time, right? Because remember, we are going to be uh, around for the next uh, next Monday, uh, just in case you start working on a project or you just have any questions that pop up during the week or anything like that. Uh, but I do want to leave some time for questions or to go back and handle anything that maybe you feel needs a little bit more focus, even if it's now project management accessibility or anything like that. Um, so, so I don't want to leave it up and leave it open. Um, and I believe Karen uh, wants to say something. It's true. I'll stop uh, sure. I would like to uh, continue your comment, Elvis, about quality because um, sometimes that's a loaded term in open ed and some would say we don't want to focus on quality as much as we want to focus on efficacy. And we're probably um, using quality as an inclusive term to include efficacy. If you remember um, David Reck's lecture on research and pedagogical tools and textbook design, that is what informs a lot of the structure and design of textbooks produced at Scribe. So when we say quality, we don't only mean um, the look and feel and organization, but also the, the research and um, what that says about how to best uh, develop and design a textbook. So we definitely have efficacy in mind when we say quality. And just to add that, that comes from our, um, from our mentality here at Scribe, where we think, like we think of quality as this idea where it's all inclusive, not only the, the, the work that we're putting into it, uh, but the work that, you know, we're helping the authors produce and whatnot. So uh, my apologies if that landed in, in, a, in a bad way, but I do not mean quality as just like, hey, it, it looks nice and the content is nothing. So do you have any questions or concerns? Anything that we want to talk about before, um, before we, we close? We still have time. We have plenty of time. So. This is Alicia, and I have a question that may or may not be related, and I have been kind of waiting to ask it because I'm just, like I said, I'm just not really sure where it fits. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that we do the e-text initiative. People are writing, and all with the goal at this point of using iBooks Author. Mm -hmm. When it's done, it can be an EPUB 3 document. It can be in several formats. Of course, Apple wants us to put it in there, um, leave it in iBooks Author and make it ready for iBooks and do all the multi-touch functionality mm -hmm. and give the accessibility pieces a real shake. So my question, person who builds the book and goes through that process, puts it in Apple's store it's free it's available for download is that something that with some modifications we can put through the workflow through scribe or is that something that well because you put it over here you really can't do that over here and should i be as the first person that a lot of our faculty come to when they say okay publisher wants me to do this i'd rather make my own e-text how can you help me should i be kind of directing them to think about the Scribe OTN workflow separate from the Apple one, or should I, you know, how kind of where does that fit if anybody's thought about it or had to deal with that? Okay. Um, I think, Tim, I don't know if you might have um, a little bit more to say on that end, but um, what I would say, just thinking about that, because I haven't really given that um, um, a lot of thought, I think that you don't have to necessarily treated as two separate things. I think that we can go through our workflow and then you'll have the, the, the EPUB that I think you can just load into, um, into iBooks and then we can make whatever changes at that point. But I don't want to speak out of turn, so I'll, I'll, speak, I'll send it to Tim and see if he has um, a better answer. You know, actually, I do wish that John was still here because I, I mentioned it briefly to him. Um, it's something that we have some experience with, but I would... I would agree with Elvis that we don't, I don't want to think about it as redoing something, but I think that it puts us a little at odds with some of the things that we do because the iBooks authorship is really designed to go to like a single product through a single 
um, distribution point. And a lot of what our practices and the ebooks that are derived from our uh, hub are designed to be spread out across many different things. So there are like backwards compatibility things that you go through in the hub, and there is a sort of larger, I can kind of use the word accessibility issue um, that, or advantage that you get by going through the hub. So if it's possible to have them at least author in something like you know, Word or some other XML format, whether it's LaTeX or something else like that, um, even, you know, Google Docs or something. And then we can take it to a point where it can be run through the hub, I think, rather simply after the authorship is completed. And then you have the advantage of this one product that can be used across multiple devices, you know, older generation devices. So it's not necessarily someone working with the newest or just Apple only product. So it's a little bit like wider in that sense. And then go through the iBooks and stuff if you wanted to, like you said, go to the device specific things like multi touch functionality and things like that. Um, yeah. But we always kind of, I'm sorry, go ahead. We, we, we do start with them in Word or Google Docs. So that, that part okay. is, yeah, so that part's good. I, I guess what I'm yep. um, hearing is that, again, once it goes into the Apple Store, can again, mm -hmm. that same manuscript that we started with, can we take it through? And does that, because it's still open to everybody, does that mean we can't? I, I just don't. I, I just don't want to get faculty excited that they can go either direction if they really can't. And if they've put it in Apple's education store, does that mean they cannot participate in the OTN? I, I just. You know, I just, I mean, I, I need that to be crystal clear. Maybe a, like a T-square or a little table of, mm -hmm. if you start here, here are your choices. But if you stop here and you go, I, you know, that's kind of what I'm <laughs> trying to sort that out before I get faculty coming to me. And then I'm just going to pester Mark. So, Mark, I know you can hear me. I'm coming after you. <laughs> I feel your pain. One of the favorite phrases, Mark, I, that Mark became known for around this part of the campus was <laughs> the uh, the mouse will find you. So I don't want somebody from Apple chasing our faculty around saying, now, wait a minute, you can't put good stuff you gave us a year ago and also mm -hmm. make it available through OTN, even if technologically we can do that because, again, we all started from this main document. Okay, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Yeah, Karen, I don't know if you want to speak to that specifically. I think I can talk more to the technological workflow yeah. of it, but whether or not it's you've given it to Apple, then it's just theirs. I'm not quite sure about that. So, um, Alicia, I think you're onto something with um, talking to Mark, because Mark, if not, your whole team has access to the uh, publishing cooperative pilot, basically our MOU. So it depends on the open license, as Anita said in the chat, and whether or not what's in um, Apple now has that open license, um, but what we're looking for in the pilot, according to our MOU, are um, original books with an open license. Now, there have, I have had conversations with other people like Karen at Portland State who says, well, you know, I'm also really interested in perhaps doing new editions of popular textbooks we've already published in this new format where we can really step it up for the second edition. Um, and we can totally talk about that. We would just also want to be sure that each institution is making uh, at least two new CC BY textbooks during this time. Uh, let me just, just add that um, th while there are significant differences between the, uh, the Apple iBook for platform than, than EPUB, you can publish EPUB through Apple, but it has limited navigation, I think is what, what is my understanding. So I would, uh, the, the main objections I see with open access and the Apple platform is that it does cut you off from, uh, it, it, it creates a digital divide. If people don't have Apple products, then they can't, actually get access to the, uh, the, the, the books in iTunes uh, if it's done in, in, the, in the iBook plat, uh, uh, format. So you have to be careful about that. But if, I mean, 
in principle, you can make an, an EPUB and an iBook without without a, with, without having a problem, and it's still open access. I, I I think the big the big issue is: Are you going to want to do these multi-touch and uh, other issues? Are you going to want to do that twice so that you make sure that everyone has access to it? That's my thoughts anyway. Yeah, that's how we're doing it now. We're, we're creating it through iBooks author. Well, the workflow is pretty simple. I get a document. We add the photos and videos after we've put in the captioning and you pull that together in iBooks author. Once it's published, I can publish it in multiple formats. Because here at our campus, we have so many people that do not have an iPad. We actually at the manuscript stage simultaneously set up a website. So all of the authors in our eText initiative all have their own website that again, we're going to be using hype or some of the other tools hyper, you know, to basically give the alternative format, even using something simple as PDF, which is just a starting point but making sure that anything that's created, and so far this workbook that we put together and I shared earlier, it's a small enough, it's not like this massive textbook, like you know, a biochemistry 300 page document. And it's very tailored to the course. So again, the expectation from the get-go was making sure this was available through the course to all the students. So anyway, it's, it's already in Black, we're using Blackboard here at UC. Um, so it's in Blackboard. It's got its own module. The professor has actually shared it with other professors also teaching anatomy and physiology. So we've kind of had a very unscientific but highly effective, let's see who can break it. So far, so good. And again, by providing the multiple formats, having the, the for example, all of the videos that you wouldn't be able to see unless you had an iPad um, are all in the course as well as on the faculty's um, website. So it's again separate from, so there may be more than one way to go after it, um, but that's how we're working with the multiple formats at this point. And again, it may be that the advantage, once a person comes in my office anyway and says, okay, I got a manuscript, help me get it in the Open Textbook Network, is to say, well, here's, here's your list of things we'll do to get it there. Here's your list of things if you want it to be Apple. And I see this as just the front end. In fact, I was uh, the last couple of weeks, it looks to me like if I have a person go through the process with Scribe, like Tim was saying, then the last little piece, toss it into iBooks author and away we go that direction. So we don't lose that. So again, I, I got partially a permission and the word permission being thrown around quite a bit this little bit today. That's what made me think maybe here's the place to ask my stupid question. But I realize now it may be opening a can of worms that we, we haven't yet dove into fully, but um, I appreciate all of your feedback very much. And I would think just as a, without like fully um, knowing everything that's going into it, you know, I think if we do things the way that you just described towards, uh, towards the end where it's like we have everything within OTN, um, you know, and using us and using our workflow. Um, and then at the end, sort of just then taking that and doing the Apple um, iBooks authoring, then I think that sh should work. Now, the permission thing, you know, I, I see on the chat that Anita was saying, like, you know, if something has an open license, you can put it anywhere. Uh, but if you, you know, have an exclusive license, you're bound to it. Um, so the the issue is, is like what Apple is considering you're doing with, uh, you know, with that text. But if you've already authored that through us, I don't see why they would, like why they would claim, like saying, hey, you know, this is this is ours. You sort of gave this to us on our end. Um, but that would, I think that's a, a, a deeper conversation um, than what we have time for now. But um, hopefully that, I think, should answer a little bit of, of your concern, hopefully. Um, but I think, are we clear on that, Karen? I don't know if you want to add. Uh, yeah, don't put anything past Apple, that's true. Um, yeah. So like Anita said in the chat as well, um, and thank you all for, for your expertise. Um, see, this is why it's good for us to all work together. Um, read the terms uh, carefully. 
Uh, Karen, I think you wanted to add something. Uh, no, I'm just okay. nodding in agreement. You know, it's okay. easy not to read those terms, mm -hmm. or it's easy for me not to as a lay person. Uh, someone in our family just did ancestry DNA. And then I started researching, like, what are the terms of sharing your mm -hmm. DNA with these um, organizations? And, you know, it can be a little, uh, the devil's in the details. Mm -hmm. So I don't know um, what Apple puts out there either, but I wouldn't put anything past it, as Mark said. But yeah, just to echo, um, you know, these, these are openly licensed works. We have no problem with you sharing it the way you want to share it, in whatever format you want to share it, whatever platform. Um, that's all well and good. Um, and I think, you know, just reflecting for yourself as a project manager in your own capacity in terms of um, wanting to balance, you know, what you provide, the options you provide faculty and students with your capacity in terms of your time and your team is probably a, a main consideration for that question. It did also make me think, though, of um, authoring options. Uh, a couple people have mentioned LaTeX. So maybe just um, spend uh, Elvis and Tim a minute talking more about how that can work in this workflow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about something like LaTeX, and I'll, I'll just say this, Kathy asked me a question and I'll, we'll get to it, don't worry. Um, but when we're working with something like LaTeX, we have someone here who, um, who's worked with it and they can convert it to SCML. So essentially what we, the workflow works in this sense of like, if you have something in, you know, God knows what it is, right? Um, like, for example, a long time ago, we used to deal with um, types of files that were in Quark, right? Uh, which, you know, by now has uh, become relatively uh, not as used as, um, as InDesign, uh, but we still have the capability to take those files and convert them into SCML, and then from SCML go off into everything else. So um, it would just take, um, like, giving us like the files and saying, okay, now we'll figure out how we can get that into SCML. But um, we are willing to ingest um, um, anything that you are willing to <laughs> painful flashbacks to court term setting. Yep. Um, you know, we're willing to ingest anything that you send our way and, and make it into SCML and then make that part of the workflow. So um, there shouldn't be any limitations unless you send us something weird, like, I don't know, autographics or something that is like so, Oh, well, and even PowerPoint that. has proven tough. To <laughs> yeah, exactly. We had somebody author in PowerPoint, and that was a little bummer. Yeah, but we did it, didn't we? Yeah, we did do it. So that's the thing. So it might like if you send us something that's like out of the, like out of left field, we'll we'll look at it and we'll make it work. But um, you know, unless it's in like it, Sanskrit or something. Yeah, I, I think the other thing to um, stress, and this goes back to something we talked about a long time ago is that you know, we prefer to compose at the very beginning and apply all those structures, but there's flexibility there. So if your authors are uncomfortable with that, or if you have people who are working three different types of things and they're collaborating, then kind of I mean, tying composition back to vetting, look at what your authors are doing and think if you're gonna go through this route, these files have to get applied at some states. Do they get applied in an XML version, like a SAM file? Do they get applied uh, after we like, you know, convert a Google Doc to a Word Doc and then start edits that way. Um, so there's a couple different entry points into that that sort of circle that we showed last week. So it might be something that your authors are working in many different formats, but it's fine because what we're going to do is just take whatever the final author version is and then introduce it to composition. So it's not not our preferred method, because again, we prefer get the Word document, compose it, start editorial stuff that way because we find it a little easier to track edits that way but it's not something where if your authors are doing their authorship in x method then it doesn't mean then it means it can't go through that that's you know not a not a thing yeah mm -hmm. and so so hopefully uh, that answered that question um kathy's question is like if you have all your images as cc by do you need to put text under every um image um, or can you, I'm assuming it's, or can you just put it on the copyright page and say all images are CC by? Um, I'm thinking that you can just put it on the copyright page, but um, I will defer to someone who is more experienced with Creative Commons. Um, but I believe that as long as it's listed somewhere that all images are this, and they actually are, um, you, should be, you should be okay. 
Um, I don't know if anybody wants to refute that or, or correct me if I'm wrong. And Kathy just noted that. Um, um, all the images that she's referring to are created by the author. So I think they're the same thing. You could put, you know, all images by, you know, VJ in this case. Uh, there we go. And Anita has kindly provided the best practices for attribution. So we can yeah. check that out. And I'll echo Mark's comment of keeping a log. We have what we refer to as a, an art log. Uh, and that includes sometimes maybe an author's description of something, file names that we're going to use. Um, and there might be cases where it's like, this is the original version. Here's the properly licensed replacement. And it's attribution that's going to go into the book. Um, it's also very helpful because then you can share this with either your authors or your designers and typesetters and people can kind of mark them as completed or, you know, mark it as read and, hey, we can't find a version of this or, hey, there's an issue with this image. So it's another communication tool as a project manager. Also true. Yeah. yeah. And say Anita has added that, yeah, some people uh, will list attribution details under each image or have citations at the end of the chapter. And we've seen um, people list them like at the end of a book, like just have like this, the figure number and the attribution details, you know, as almost like a figure credits uh, list at the end of the book. Yeah. So you have options as long as things are done correctly. I think we're okay. Okay. Do we have any other questions or concerns? We have about 10 minutes left in the class. I know some people like to leave 10 minutes early, but still, if we have questions. <laughs> Carla, thanks everyone. This is very good. And so, so I think Karen, if you want to, um, you know, set up next steps and things, I'll leave it to you. Okay. I appreciate all of the resource sharing in the chat. I'm going to add, add these uh, resources to our modules. Yes. So as we um, wrap up, I just want to let you guys know um, what we have on our plate in terms of what we're working on next for the pilot. And that is by popular demand uh, templates. So um, resources that we can share with you that you can choose to share with your authors. That's at the top of our list. The style guide that uh, Elvis and Tim have mentioned. Again, um, there's a lot of flexibility and latitude in what you decide to do, but we are creating textbooks and we wanna give you some parameters um, that we actually think will make life easier for you and your authors. And those will be um, adapted into style sheets that you can share with your authors, including examples of what's expected. Um, and that will help uh, us all develop author parameters before they start writing like we talked about today. And then of course, we'll also be revisiting the curriculum and I'll be asking for your feedback um, about our ideas for how to revisit the curriculum and I'll keep you updated on that. Um, so nothing is gonna change in the Canvas course without you hearing about it in advance. Um, if you think that you may want to pop in next Monday, I encourage you to browse the syllabus or YouTube to trigger any kind of, now what was that about? Or I've forgotten that since we talked about it. Again, we'll be here Monday, same time, same channel. Um, we'll hang around for about half an hour to see if anybody drops in. Um, we welcome any of your questions. If not, we'll see you at tea time. I'll send a note to everyone um, to remind you about tea time. It'll be the first Monday in May. And I just wanted to thank all of you for being adventurous and experimental in joining us in this pilot. Um, we're trying to solve a big problem in uh, designing a new publishing model that can work. And as David Reck sometimes says, we may all be dead before we find a publishing model that works. Um, never mind, we're adding this additional layer of complexity in open education. And so I hope that you find this exciting. Um, it is complicated, it's tricky, it's not something we're gonna solve uh, in one iteration. And so um, I'm glad that we're in it together. 
So yes, same time on Monday, that's 8 a.m. Pacific, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, and we are, as always, available um, outside of our orientation time. So I will miss our Ritual Monday week kickoff, um, but I know that we'll stay in touch as you guys start working on projects. So please keep us posted on how things are going. And I'd also like to thank you all for for joining and for bearing with us and for giving us that that feedback that sort of helped direct us in, in the direction that I think everybody learned best. It was very helpful for us, very eye-opening for us as well. So we thank you all for, for your patience with us as well um, and for every Monday just being here and, and learning and we, we appreciate it. So um, just wanted to share that. Yeah, Malika as well, thank you for helping us and for helping us improve our um, training and um, explanatory skills. So I think we're good to go. I'm going to click the end meeting button now. <laughs> Fairly well. Well, bye.